Thank you. All right, I think we're set now with the uh, technical issues. So my name is Dave. I'm currently a master's student at SUNY Oneonta in the Lake Management Program. Um, but I spent five years on the coast of Massachusetts after my undergraduate degree. And during my time there in Massachusetts, uh, I met Ben Gehig and he hired me on as a fisheries tech out there. And I worked with, it, with him on some diagramist stuff. And uh, I'm really fortunate when I reached out to him last year, he passed me this data set for a class project, and I've kind of been running with it ever since. So it represents a whole bunch of work from a whole bunch of different people, and I'm really fortunate and grateful to be able to present this to you guys today. So without further ado, I guess let's jump in and talk about some animal life growth. So we have data from uh, six different populations of animal life throughout the coastal region of Massachusetts. And uh, you can see those rivers denoted here on the map. They're pretty variable systems. They're variable in length. They have different numbers of uh, fish ladders, and they're also pretty variable in terms of where they run. You know, you've got one river there you can see running through downtown Boston, and you have another that runs through a national wildlife refuge. So pretty varied systems. Since 2013, there have been biological samples taken from these systems. Uh, during that time, there's been an observed difference in length and size of these fish in some of these rivers. You can see in the figure here at the top of this slide that uh, some of these rivers have a, a higher size distribution than other rivers. And I can tell you from being out in and actually sampling during my time out there in Massachusetts that uh, just visually, like uh, I spent some time on the Back River, you go out there and you know the fish from the Back River are just larger than some of the other rivers that we work on. Um, so this is, just represents raw data. You can see a compact letter display denoting differences using a two-piece test. Uh, we do have high sample sizes, so it's pretty easy to detect a difference, but you can definitely see there's a visual difference in that distribution for the back, followed by the Damascus department. Size differences in these populations are gonna be really important in terms of the biology and ultimately for management of these uh, populations of animal life. Uh, larger fish are gonna have uh, produce more eggs, they're going to be have higher fitness, and they're going to produce more uh, biomass to towards the total population. So it's really important for managers to understand why these size differences are occurring, and really for the scope of this project, we were looking to determine uh, at what point in life history these size differences were are occurring. So the working hypothesis we had for this project was that uh, there's faster growth in nurseries and spawning areas, including estuaries, that is setting the stage for greater size throughout the remainder of the fish's life. So basically, some of these rivers are getting a, a head start, a jump on other rivers, and that difference is starting while they're young is remaining throughout the rest of their lives. So this is the data that we started out with. Um, this is raw data of length and age. And uh, I think that was a good time to point out uh, the rivers that we expect. The lines here are observed mean length at age. Uh, and the rivers that we expect to see the highest length at ages, I've uh, highlighted in shades of red. And the other three, the lower, what we expect to be lower lengths at age in shades of gray, just to help you guys keep track as we go through the presentation. So we have this uh, data set here. Um, but you can see we're missing a really important part of this curve. In fact, the part of the growth curve that we're interested in, right? The younger age classes, that really life history growth. So because we were sampling spawning runs, uh, male life don't return to spawn until they're at least two years old. Um, and even then, we have fewer two-year-olds than we do threes and fours. So we have to uh, fill in this part of the curve somehow. In order to do this, we use back calculation methods of length, fish length and age. Back calculation assumes a proportionality between the otolith radius. In our case, we use otolith, any hard part, the scales work too. Uh, so a relation, proportional relationship between the otolith radius and the total length of a fish. You can see on the bottom here a uh, LF otolith and the otolith lab at UMass. Um, so we have to assess that relationship and determine, knowing the radius of the otolith when we captured it and the total length, we can then measure out to each annulus and back calculate total length, knowing that uh, relationship. But we do have to pay attention to the relationship a little bit, determine if we're talking about isometric growth, which would be a linear trend, one-to-one -one growth, linear line, or allometric growth, which would be a variation from that one-to-one -one trend, either positive or negative. 
So we're going to look at some of the raw data and uh, how I went through the process of back calculating these lengths next. So this slide denotes the raw data that we started with. In the upper right hand corner you can see the, uh, it's about 5,000, like I said, 5,000 adult radius, OLEF radius to capture versus their total length. And you can see just considering that data set, it's a quite a linear trend. However, we also have the lower left hand corner of this figure is a data set from UMass uh, of juveniles from those same six rivers. So you can see, in order to fill in this white space in here, we're going to have to introduce some sort of curvature into our back calculation function. Uh, despite this, the first and most simple back calculation function to fit is uh, the one that considers isometric growth or linear growth. It's the direct proportion method. So if we do that, this is what we end up with. You can see we filled in that white space rather nicely, um, but it looks like we're o likely overestimating total length at age for uh, otolith radii in the range of like 0.6 to at least 1 millimeter. Um, however, this likely is going to be a little more robust to uh, individual variability in fish growth <laughs> over time. But uh, I'm going to show you now just once we introduce some curvature into this back calculation function, first I'm going to show you what it would look like with an exponential curve. So you can see that we've shifted really the belly of that beast down a little bit with this function, um, but we're still overestimating those younger age fish in terms of total length. Ultimately, we settled on this one, which is the, called the modified Bryback calculation model, and it introduces these two uh, parameters you see on the title of the figure here, uh, L0 and R0. That's length at hatch and radius of the oval at, at hatch. We control those. Um, so the two numbers you see here, 5.7 for L0 and 0.0225 for uh, radius, are numbers I pulled from the literature actually for Atlantic carrying, um, and I figured they can convey pretty well, and you'll see it's a decent fit for the data. However, those uh, parameters significantly influence our back calculated length. So if I change R0, you can see how much we've shifted those back calculated lengths. So it's really important that we uh, do, our, do our due diligence and uh, determine the correct parameters. Ultimately, we decided to use data that we know. We used data from the, that juvenile data set to constrain those values to the curve to go through that juvenile data set. And this is what we ended up with. So now we have a data set that looks much more conducive to fitting a uh, growth curve to. So uh, this is the rip off the band-aid slide where I talk about a little bit of math. It's not too bad, and I can understand it, I'm sure you all can. Uh, when we were thinking about fitting a growth function, um, my advisor Dan's been working with this one. It's a reparameterization of the classic von Bertalanffy growth function that we all know and love. Um, it introduces this new growth parameter omega, which you can see here highlighted in red. Omega is equal to the classic growth parameter k multiplied by L infinity. So in order to uh, insert that into our growth function, we're going to have to replace L infinity. So you can see here L infinity highlighted in red in the classic von Bertalanffy growth function. And you can see by simple substitution, in order to get L infinity by itself, we're just going to replace it with omega divided by k. Ultimately, the omega parameter gets at growth near age zero, which is super handy because that's what we're interested in. Um, so this is the growth function that we fit. We fit this with innovation hierarchical modeling framework that allowed us the flexibility that we needed to compare growth between these uh, six populations. Within that framework, we fit a random effective population so that we could compare growth between the six rivers. And we also used an estimated T0 from the global population. So we took, we considered all the data that we had, and we estimated a T0 from all 5,000 fish, and we held that T0 constant for our model run. I'm going to show you results from doing it both ways to hopefully clarify why we decided to do that and how we're going to move forward, which, speaking of which, uh, today I'm just presenting results for model runs that contain the adult data only. Um, because our models blew up when we included the juvenile data. Uh, so ultimately we'd like to bring those juvenile back in to constrain the model to go through those juvenile data, which is real world data, versus using this estimated global parameter. However, I'm very confident that the estimated T0 is a pretty realistic biological um, scenario, because if you think about it, it's all the same species, within the same geographic range, their T0s in real life likely are very close to each other. And that's likely what we expect to see when we bring those juveniles back in. So with that, I'm going to move on to some uh, results. 
And uh, so this first set of curves is the resulting growth curves when we allow T0 to vary between each population. So you can see in bold here, we have a unique T0 for each population. And you can see very clearly that those uh, lengths at, at age zero start at a different point right here uh, from age zero. So we're starting at a different point. And this is important to know. First off, we can see the shades of red came out on top like we expected. Um, but it's important to note that because we're starting from different points at age zero, uh, we're going to influence those growth parameters further down the line. Um, in order to uh, meaningfully uh, analyze differences in growth in these six populations, we really have to start from the same point. And it's kind of handy that it seems most biologically likely that that's the scenario happening in the real world. Um, so another point I want to make on this slide is that uh, the growth parameter k, remember om omega is equal to k multiplied by l infinity. So the growth parameter k, the rate of approach to the asymptote, to, to the theoretical maximum length, uh, is directly influences omega. So a higher k is going to result in a higher omega and vice versa. So another way we can look at this is just to look at some box plots of the growth parameters. Um, and hopefully that will clear things up if things are getting a little muddy for you. First off, we're going to look at L infinity. Remember, we can derive L infinity from our growth function by doing omega divided by k. So that's how we pull these out. You can see the back river again in red comes out on top, followed by the Damascus and the Parker. And then just what I was talking about with the classical growth parameter k, when we allowed t0 to vary between populations, we see that the back river actually has the lowest k of any of these rivers. And conceptually, this made sense at first. We were like, OK, well, it has the highest L infinity. It would take a little longer for the population to reach that, uh, that level. Um, however, as I said before, and I'm going to say this ad nauseum, but uh, it's probably not biologically meaningful because it, it's more of a factor of the mathematical fit of the model than what is most biologically um, relative, what most likely is going on in the system in real life. So just what I said, when we look at these are the omega values now, uh, so we see that this omega parameter, which again suggests growth near age zero, is the lowest in the back river and the parker, and then the master falls out somewhere in the pack. So I'm going to move on now and show you the model runs where we held T0 constant. So you can very clearly see here, this set of curves starts from the same point at age zero. And uh, next, so now we can compare growth in a more meaningful way since we've started from the same point. So we're going to go ahead and look at these growth parameters, same way we did last time. And we see that, uh, the, again, the back falls out on top, followed by the Damascus. And this time, the Parker River fell out a little more mid-pack in terms of L infinity. However, this is the big difference when we look at Ks. You can see a huge difference. There's not as much variability here. The Ks are very similar across all of these rivers, which means the river with the higher L infinity is going to have the higher omega, which is what we see here. The back river comes out on top, followed by the Damascus and Parker, suggesting that when we hold T0 constant, this gives us some credence to our hypothesis that uh, growth near age 0 is greater in these systems. Uh, we do have a little more evidence to support this. Mean length at age for every back calculation scenario I ran, uh, the back, the Parker, and the Damascus always came out on top for back calculated length at age one. So by age one, this disparity in size is present. Um, that in combination with model parameter support at uh, when T0 is held constant gives us, uh, lends us to believe that we're providing some significant support for our hypothesis that that uh, growth near age zero is greater in some of these systems. Moving forward, we're working on fitting a downward style curve to uh, bring those juvenile data back in and hopefully constrain those curves to go through a meet more meaningful uh, intercept around age zero. And uh, initial runs of that modeling framework have proven uh, they look pretty good so far. Um, and then ultimately, we're going to take a quick look at cohort effects as well, just to see if there's any uh, individual age class that's having an undue impact on any of these systems. So as I said, this represents a lot of work by a lot of different people. These are just a few of them. Hopefully, I haven't forgotten anybody. 
Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take a question if we have the time.